Did you still get sick? Yes. Did I hear this? No, that means. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk uh, both about some photo elements and about science. Uh, uh, the title of the talk is Transition Information in Turbulent Pro Protoplanetics, and that's the science part, but the core part I'll talk about is, is the cell gravity and how uh, I, during the last year, together with uh, Dr. Jeff Uishi and Mordecai Mark and Mike Lowe, <coughs> we have implemented cell gravity in the core. Um, so just starting with the with the code development part, so of course the self-gravity is about solving a Poisson equation that means that our in our equation of, of motion where the tensor code of course solves these terms beautifully and this this new term, this is the gradient of the cell potential. And to calculate this you need to solve some kind of Poisson equation, uh, which is a partial differential equation, and on this right hand side you have the gravitational constant and then you have rho, which could be the gas density if you want to know about gas self-gravity, but it could also be the density of drugs fluid or dust particles. So. Um, and when you solve the Poisson equation, what I did was that I looked in the miracle recipes and you get a lot of good advice. And um, so there's a lot of different ways to do it. You can just discretize your Poisson equation and, and try to invert the, the matrix, which is good in 1D when you get a triangular matrix, but in 3D it starts to get to, uh, to not be a triangular matrix anymore. You need to do a lot of operations. And you really don't want it anything to scale with n squared or, or anything higher. Then there's the FOT method where you go into Fourier space and you solve the Poisson equation like this. You solve for the potential at, at scale k as a function of, of the density at scale k. And this is nice because it's kind of almost linear with, with, with the number of your know, grid points. Um, so this works, of course, well for periodic boundaries and in, in, in the infinite space. Then there's also some relaxation methods where you turn the Poisson equation into a diffusion e equation. And there's some much good solvers where, where you try to get some faster convergence here. So there's a lot of possibilities, possible ways to solve the Poisson equation. Um, um, so uh, what we decided for was the FFT method, which is to, to, to fully transform a uh, row and then solve for phi in, in, in the Fourier space. This works on a <coughs> nicely on an equidistant grid periodic boundary condition, so we thought this was very much in the physical spirit, um, where we often work in periodic boundary conditions. It's also suitable for <coughs> for shear uh, sheet equations, which was something that I really wanted because I wanted to look at planet formation in, in protoplanetary disk, where the shear sheet is a good approximation. Um, so the, the thing with this is that it's fairly straightforward, but there's a few caveats. One is you need to do a lot of parallel FFTs, and this was already in the code to do power spectrum, but, but we had to generalize it quite, quite a lot in order to, to, to work more more general. And we also had to, so we had to generalize to do inverse transforms, and we also had to maybe work with the shearing boundaries, where the X boundary is not strictly periodic. So this is just an example, I'll just go through some test problems. Uh, there's a, 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 a deep problem in, in one deal with periodic boundaries, so this is very, very straightforward, no shearing boundaries or anything. Uh, this is the, uh, the linearized equation, you get this dispersion relation out, and in, in this sample uh, we compare, I think the last like two lines here, the, the, the lines directly on, on top of each other, on each time this is the maximum density. So, just some ways to test the code uh, that the uh, Poisson equation solved for correctly. One interesting thing is actually that if you, if you let the G's problem evolve non-linearly non, non, non in, in 1D, you get a, another uh, known analytical solution, which is come from Spitzer 1942. You get this fun, funny row of set to be some kind of tangent hyperbolically square. And this is what I'm showing uh, here with, with, this, with this line, this function of, of set, this is still, still just some 1D model. And you can see here that the numerical solution this matches very well here in the center of the box at the at the upper lower boundary, it doesn't match so well because the Spitzer solution uh, assumes infinite space and this assumes periodic boundary conditions. So that's just something with the boundary conditions. But it shows that there's not only linear test problems, there's also non-linear test problems, which is of course always very nice. Um, then you can go to a rotating frame and you can solve kind of a tumor problem, which means that you add some. Um, uh, it means that the, the, that you add some coded force. You have u with u x u y is a two D problem. You have coded force and and the shear. Um, and again, you know, there's a sample that checks for this, and, and as a function of time, the maximum row follows. You see, when the maximum row starts approaching 0 0.1 or, or 1, then the linear uh, uh, analysis breaks down, of course, and, and, and there's a difference between the code solution and the analytical solution, but there's a very beautiful correspondence that 
at the linear in, in the linear machine. So one thing was to make this work in the student box, and this is where we have to think about student only conditions that are not not strictly periodic. Um, so if you if you take here the the, the, the x boundary, of course, if you take a a, a, a grid cell here, it does <coughs> correspond to a grid cell here. It actually corresponds to some other cell here. Um, and in this case, we followed Gammy 2001, who with the SUSE code actually uh, proposed that one could simply transform to, to, to non shearing coordinates and then do the Fourier transform there. And this goes as follows You start with rho, in this case, I have made a, a non axis symmetric rho, and you see again that this is the x direction there. It's not strictly periodic like this, it's more it's periodic. Yeah, this point corresponds to this point actually. Um, so what we do first is we fully transform in the periodic y direction, this is fine. But then afterwards we shift the entire y direction so that the x direction gets periodic. It's more, it always corresponds to taking all this and shifting like this. Yeah. Then you fully transform in the now periodic x direction, you fully transform in the z direction, then you solve the Poisson equation as you would always do, and then, then you transform back to real space. And then you get the, the potential, which is then also a shear <coughs> and, and, and you see exactly where the row, where density is higher, the potential is low, when the density is low, the potential is high. And you don't see any funny things happening at the boundaries. Um, so this seems to be really the, the, the right way to get the potential in, in shear coordinates. Um, uh, yeah, so, so then you, we tested uh, a few things. We tested self-gravitating sound waves, and self-gravitating shear waves. We start out with a non axitometric initial condition, some kind of uh, sound wave. And then we, we uh, we actually, because there, 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 there's really no analytical solution anymore, then we, we integrated the uh, linear equations uh, and, uh, numerically and we compared with the result of the code and we again got very good, co good correspondence. Um, so just about timings, I uh, have here 64 cube, 128 cube, the stars show with self-gravity, the process without self-gravity. Uh, and you see here at, at, that there's about a factor two between those two here. So self-gravity so means that the code runs about a factor too slow. Um, and that's mostly because of the Fourier, that's mainly because of the Fourier transform. Actually, it's not so much the Fourier transform themselves, it's mostly that you have to shuffle so much mem memory around, and especially that you have to do Fourier transform along the set direction, which means that you cobble parts of the memory that are not contiguous at all. So there's a big, uh, big cache efficiency problem, which I think is the main reason why it goes from, from, from here to here. It's not that you actually do the Fourier transform, that's fairly fairly cheap. Um, and, and you see that there's a very nice scaling here at 64 cube, it actually starts to, so, so this would be perfect scaling, it actually starts to, to level off quicker uh, with self gravity than, than without self gravity. But, but here at 128 cube, it actually scales nicely all the way up to 64, 64 processors. So, um, yeah. All right, so the science part I wanted to do, to do, to do with this was to have self gravitating dust particles in MRI turbines, so magneto taken turbines, and a local model of the Clarion Accretion Disk. And I'll come back and explain later what this means. This part means. I just need to talk a little bit about science. Uh, so the idea was that we wanted to know how to make planetismals. And most of you who don't know what a planetismal is, that it's a hypothesized kilometer size object. Uh, that was important in planet formation because they were massive enough to attract each other by, by, by gravity. So planet formation, you start with small dust screens. The small dust screens collide to build up bigger and bigger bodies. Uh, but gravity between those bodies, only because important, between two single bodies, wants to go to something like kilometers. And in that case, it gets more, much easier Then they start attracting each other. But the problem is to get to uh, kilometers. Uh, and the thing is that, yeah, planet systems are important because they are the building blocks of planets. Uh, so you can have your n-body code and sismo to build up Earth. Uh, and the formation is believed that you go from micrometers to centimeters simply when dust grains collide and stick to each other. And then it's not really known how to go from centimeters or meters to kilometers. What people, some people say, well, you just continue to stick boulders and pebbles together. And some people say, look, this is never going to happen because boulders don't stick very well. And some people say, well, they may, two boulders or pebbles might not be massive enough to attract each other directly by gravity, but if you have a lot of them, you can have a gravitational in instability. Um, and this was this last scenario that we wanted to examine. Um, and, and what we looked at was uh, test disks that were uh, turbulent due to magnetic rotational turbulence, so it's a very robust source of turbulence. We probably can this where the ionization is okay, and also where the Trumpet number is okay. I think so we'll talk about. 
uh, in, a, in a few days, but we just assumed a prime number of one, we assumed the MRI works. We didn't think too much about why. Um, so we just make some make some nice shear she box, no vertical gravity on, on the gas, um, and get this kind of nice turbulence out. And the reason why this is, then we put afterwards particles, dust particles in there, and the reason why this is interesting is that gas accelerates the solid particles by drag force. So whenever there is a velocity difference between particles and gas, then there's a drag force opposite, in the opposite direction uh, working on the time scale tau f, which is a, a, a friction time. And um, so the interesting thing now is if you normalize tau f with the Keplerian omega, because then you know that if this, is, if this value is a Stokes number, which some people call it, this value is very small, then the particles can just follow the gas around, it's not so interesting. But if this value becomes around unity, which means that a particle covers to the gas on an also time scale, then the particles are still affected by the gas, but they can also move relative to the gas. And this is where a lot of interesting things can happen. This happens to correspond to approximately meter sized uh, particles in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a solar nebula. Um, so what will happen is that um, the particles will, so again this is the typical shearing box, now I'm now showing the density of particles, so this is the, the vertical direction, the smooth direction, the vertical direction. What you see here is that the particles will actually form, uh, once they get big enough, they will sediment out of the gas and they will fall to the mid plane of, of this. Uh, and this is what has happened here, but it gets into this balance where, where this, the sedimentation towards the mid plane of the disk is balanced by the turbulent diffusion because there's because there's, uh, the, there's turbulence which is always stirring the particles up again, so that there's this uh, sedimentation diffusion. Uh, um, <coughs> um, and now I, I have to say that, that, that we don't treat particles as a fluid because that's not really valid when you go to sufficiently big particles. We actually, so, so, so this would be treating particles as a fluid. You have this um, it's equation of motion and a continuous equation. But what, what we actually do is that we treat them as numerical superparticles means that each, each particle has a, its own velocity uh, and, and its, own, it, 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 its own position. Um, and one can think about what is correct. Is it correct to treat particles as a fluid or, or, or treat particles as particles? So with particles, I've got mean solid particles. Uh, and, and then you, you see that, okay, if you, have some, if you have some mechanism for localizing the flow, anything can be treated as a fluid in my heuristic point of view. Uh, so imagine you have a lot of red particles that are moving in this direction. <coughs> this blue particle, this moon particle move, moves in there and, so, and, and, and manages to maintain its own velocity vector. Then it's not really a, 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 a fluid behavior anymore because then you have multiple velocity, velocities at the same point in space. So, so then you would have to treat it as, as uh, super particles, as, in, as individual particles. But I think if the drag force, imagine in the background here, if there was a gas that had a very strong drag force observing on the particles, then when this blue particle was moving here, it would have to do the same as the other particles. In that case, you could treat dust as a fluid. Um, so, so the criterion is more or less that if, if drag forces are very, very, if particles are very, very strongly bound to the gas, then you can treat them as a fluid. If the particles are not, then you cannot treat the particles as a fluid. And in our case, they, they are not very, very strongly bound to the gas. So we need to treat the particles as, we need to treat the, the solids as, as individual particles. But actually, one thing that happens with this is that, uh, so, so this was a, a paper uh, I had last year where we tried we, to put solid particles, uh, really numerical superparticles, into MRI turbulence. I'm just going to show the movie. Um, so again, in, in the background there is MRI turbulence. Uh, this is the, the radial, as you move the vertical the direction. And just showing some 100,000 out of the two little particles here, and they happen to start to have started in the bottom of the box. I'm just we're just checking now how the particles are being moved around by, uh, by the gas. That was the only thing that was interesting. You see, when I play the movie, the particles immediately mix in everywhere because of the turbulent diffusion, and then the particles are just kind of everywhere. But sometimes they're concentrated like this, and then they are they, they are mixed together again. Yeah. So it turned out that the particles were. These boulders, these really like, like meter-sized dust boulders, they are, they are really uh, mixed together uh, with the gas, but sometimes they, 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 they experience strong concentrations. Um, and, and this is just another way of looking at these concentrations that you, you can look at the uh, color density of particles. So as a function of, of x and a function of y, is the color density of particles. And sometimes particles are really concentrated in, in such a big axisymmetric sheet. 
And if you look at the gas density at the same time, since this is very incompressible turbulence, the gas density is only plus minus three three percent or something, but the gas is slightly over than in in the same place. Um, and actually if you now take an average over the y direction, yeah, and, and you stack up a, a lot of these in in the time, and then you get into oh. Okay, I would have shown a very nice plot that would show much more clearly that there's a strong correlation between gas density and uh, particle density. And the thing is really the solid particles are kind of falling gas over density, over densities, which is a little bit strange because, you know, it's not really very strong gas over density. But the explanation is simply that um, if you have a, a gas pre pressure bomb or a radial pressure bomb, so imagine this is radial, the radial direction, this is pressure. <coughs> then on the outer side, uh, the gas is being pushed out. That means the gas feels a a weaker gravity, that means the gas is, is rotating slower. Uh, and on, on, on the other side, the gas is being pushed in, that means the, uh, the gas here feels gravity plus some extra pressure for it, that means the gas will, 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 will rotate faster. And if you look at this a little bit from above, so I said they will rotate slower here and faster here, if, if you are a dust bowler coming in here, then, then here you will feel a very strong headwind from the gas, so the gas will, will, will be rotating slower and you will lose angular momentum. So you'll be falling in, and here you will be feeling some kind of headwind in, in in the back, and that means that you'll be falling out. So the so particles will really dust ball that will really tend to end up where, where the gas pressure is, is high. Yeah. Um, okay. So another thing we looked at with with, with particles is that uh, there's a nice uh, drag force instability called uh, streaming instability, uh, which means that the coupled motion of so solids and gas and protons and disks is actually linearly unstable through so streaming instability. And it depends more or less on the solid to gas ratio and on the friction time. This is uh, the growth rate. You can see when the friction time is friction get high, you can have growth rates. This is the, the log of growth rates. You can have growth rates that are fairly big. Um, and, and this is actually so another thing I did with the Bessel code in these uh, two papers together with the Union this year is that we checked. Um, uh, we checked for so so there was this linear streaming instability. We wanted to check the nonlinear ev evolution, and, and what we saw here so <coughs> the motion of of any direction, vertical direction. And what we saw is that we, when we just put without any MRI, without any background turbulence, just put particles in there, uh, acting interacting with the gas by 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 gravity force, then you get this nice linear instability going. And after a while, so this is the particle density at at, at the different times. So you, you see this linear instability developing, and after a while it gets very strongly nonlinear, and there's a very lot strong clumping of the particles. Um, so, so actually one thing we use this for is that uh, this, this streaming instability is the only known drag force instability in protocol So it's really excellent for testing two-way drag force schemes. Uh, because once you know what the growth rate should be, you can also put in a, 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 a linear mode with the right amplitude, and then you can check that the growth rate actually fits. And this is something we did here. So we really checked the growth rate here for, for every single component. So gas x, gas velocity x, y z, gas density, particle velocity x, y z, particle density. And the growth rate really in, in this case be 0.4, and we checked as a function of the number of grid points per, per uh, wavelength. And we, we checked what the growth rate actually was. And you see when the number of grid points was reasonably high, the, the growth rate was, was very uh, the measured growth rate was very, very similar to, to the analytical growth rate. Once we got down to like eight, four, eight or four grid points, that was a big discrepancy. Um, <coughs> just want to show a movie of how this uh, streaming stability works looks in, in, the, in the 3D. Again, so it's showing parts. You don't see anything in the beginning, but now the linear instability that develops, you see these really these are linear modes. And this is again the particle density, and after a while you get some very strong clumping of, of the particles. So this is something again like meter size particles. Um, this is of course interesting also, not, not only because it's interesting non-linear effect, but, but because these over densities could become so strong that, 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 that they could become gravitationally unstable. Then we could make planetismal from meter size particles. Um, so that's actually something that we did with what we call the kitchen sink simulation, where we tried to include everything. So we combine what I've now told about in isolation with the magnetization turbulence, the sedimentation of solids, the concentrations in turbulent over densities, and the streaming instability. And then we added, most importantly, we added the soak gravity of the boulders to see if they could form a condensed clumps or, or what would happen. And then we also considered 
several particles are in not only one size, where they took, they took anything from 10 centimeters to 40 centimeters in four, in, in the four different bins. Um, and, and one thing which was interesting was to combine the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, turbulence the MRI turbulence with this two-way backward instability because I have here on the left-hand side uh, three plots where I ignore the, uh, the drag force from the particles onto the gas. In this case, this screening instability doesn't operate. And I think most importantly is maybe to look at this, uh, this uh, 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 space time plot. So this is a, a function of the relative distance from the center of the box, and this is the uh, particle column density, and you see the particles are, are, are drifting in at these kind of bands because the, this, the gas is slowing, rotating slower than the Keplerian, the particles are experiencing, experiencing some kind of hit but sometimes the particles are concentrated a little bit, like here and here and here and here. And this, is, this thing would be concentrated in, in turbulent O densities. And you see the maximum particle density in units of gas density reaches something like 10 or 50 or something. So locally the particle density can be 50 times higher than the gas density, even though globally it's maybe just similar or the particle density is even lower. But when I include now here on the right hand side the streaming instability, then something interesting happens down here, that is that this value drift is completely stopped here for several orbits, for like 20 orbits. And that's because the particles are so exerting such a drag force on the gas that in this case right here, the, 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 ga the particles are dragging, dragging the gas al along with them. That means the gas cannot be exerting any, any, any hit wind on the particles any, anymore. And you also get some very, very strong oil densities up to almost a thousand times the, the uh, gas density. Um, and now, come finally to, to, to the self gravity part, now to self gravity. And so, we first let the turbulence and the particles develop for, for 20 orbits without, uh, without any self gravity. And then, uh, in the beginning, just before we turn on self gravity, we have this situation for different sized particles. Uh, so, this is like 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters. We get that they are fairly concentrated in these typical bands. Uh, mostly, the big ones are concentrated, the small ones are not so concentrated. Uh, and when I turn on the movie, uh, so gravity starts, and you can see this, this is an announcement of, of the density region. And you see after a while, some some clump condenses out of the flow, like here. Yeah, you can also see it up here very clearly. This particularly bound clump, and you can even see that it, that is accreting sometimes. Sometimes you see these clear accretion features. At one point, it starts interacting with something else, and another clump comes out like here. So this is really the science goal we have, of course, to uh, have, s have this kind of self-gravity model. And again, here you see very clear accretion. You see the clump is growing in, in, in size at the same time. Um, so this is really a way where we, where we could make... Uh, so these clumps that put them out, like one here, actually has the mass of a thousand kilometer dwarf planet, something like the, the planet Zeta, or something just, just from, from, from the boulders. So there's a lot of boulders in, a, in there. Um, ah, and here's the interesting part. It was just accepted for, for Nature a couple of weeks ago uh, and should appear in September. So I think it's the first physical major paper. I could be wrong. Yes. Okay. Um, so hopefully it's true. <laughs> um, and it should appear somehow in September or something. Uh, what it does say here is something like uh, um, submitted uh, December 19, accepted July 18 or something. It took half a year. <laughs> So it was very long refereeing process, but in the end, it, it went through. And due to this refereeing process, also, it's, it's kind of interesting. It, it's a four-page paper, and it has uh, 50 pages of online supplement. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we produce nature referees. You make them very tired about reading the supplement in the end. Okay, so the conclusion is that self-gravity has been implemented in the Pepsi code. It works with periodic and shear periodic boundaries, and, and could be uh, generalized to work, I guess, with any boundaries if anyone was interested. Then there was the science thing with the, uh, the value drift flow of gas and particles on stable to streaming instability, and, and turbines can play a positive role in planet formation by concentrating uh, boulders in gas over densities. And some future thing is, is definitely to try to understand the correlation times of gas density structures in, in, a, in, in a variety of turbulence. It's not really known why, how long gas density and density structures live. In my simulations, they seem to live for like three or four orbits. In other simulations, like what Forman Nelson have been showing, they seem to be living for 100 orbits. Um, so it's really not known. Um, then I'm working on, together with Adam Global Stratified this model of the MRI. Um, and then uh, together with uh, Chao Cheng, Chao, uh, with Chao, Chao Cheng, who is sitting there, 
uh, and Mordecai and, and Jeff, uh, we're trying to include a dead zone in the planetesimal information model, so we would have active active MRI layers and a, and a magnetic dead zone. And then on top of that, we would try to put boulders in there and see if they would be subgravitating. And another thing I could see for, for the application of the of the subgravity and, and, and the Fourier solve and, and the uh, and the Fourier transform would be to do radiation transfer in the Swing sheet, either with MRI or with uh, with the with the subgravity. It's something that, that, that should be uh, with the radiation transfer in the Swing sheet would be interesting for, for this also. So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation about the progress uh, you introduced to the code and uh, especially the science outcome in terms of the nature package, which you are coming very into. So, uh, questions please. Um, when we are talking about particles of different radius, yeah. it just means a different Stokes number, not that the velocity is being averaged over a different distance, which is effectively affecting the particles. It means, yes, it means different slopes now, yeah. But what? It's not that um, you're actually including the size of the particles. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's only, it's only the, the, when they're very small, they're so affected by, they're very affected by drag, and when they're bigger, they're not so affected by, 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 by drag. Yeah. And it's, I didn't understand how they stick when they collide. Yeah, we, we didn't include that. We, just, we, <laughs> we didn't include the sticking. We just included the, 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 the cell gravity. So the only thing I can say is that we so found that, we so found something which is gravitational bound, but we don't know what happens below that. We don't model this kind of sticking. Yes. I just I um <coughs> you you show an animation when we see that uh, some. Uh, clamps can collide, so. mm -hmm. and and you said it, there is a, a one side, for example, uh, when it is you you can say you, you could have more clamps than the other simply because you are more uh, momentum loss on one side than the other. I trying to make the parallel when you show uh, the curve. You see the superposition of the curve saying on on this direction it's going faster so on this direction it's going faster so it's losing more momentum in this direction uh, it, it losing uh, it is losing less momentum so uh, it might it must go uh, slow uh, is that correlated with uh, the animation when you show uh, there was a small uh, screen and was it this this movie uh, yes yes okay and okay, okay. Uh, so what you're seeing, th this kind of motion here, is actually yes, yes. that's actually the Keplerian shear motion. It's just the linearized ro rotation speed. Yes. Okay. Uh, so 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 this is why. Uh, is there a side, for example, if you have a clamp more on the right or more on the left, depending? No, not not really. Also, you know, the star could be both here and here, right? If I'm not mo much mistaken. Uh, but 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 this effect where where the um, where the particles go into uh, go meet some kind of high pressure, and then the, the, the gas rotates a little bit slower on one side, a little bit faster on the other side. That comes on top of that, so you don't really see the only thing you you see here is this Keplerian shear motion. Okay. You don't see anything. Else really. But that is what they included, right? They have it. They have it, in fact. Is that not included in this simulation? Yes, they did because you have different um, driving motions or shearing speeds for the dust and for the gas. Yes, that is also included. So, that so, 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 right. so all to, yeah, that's really. So altogether because the gas fields are kind of a global pressure because the, the gas pressure falls readily. The gas fields are a, a global pressure pushing mm -hmm. it out. It means the gas is altogether ro ro rotating slower than the Kiblerian. That also means when, when your dust bowlers are they want to rotate Kiblerian, they're they're feeling this kind of headwind all the time, right? Oh, okay. So well, one can maybe see a little bit of motion in this direction, and that would be the particles that are losing angular momentum, or okay. changing with the gas. Okay. How long did it take? How long did it take? It it we ran for like seven orbits, and it's so gravitational bound, so it will continue to live. That's not a worry. That's what one could worry about is, is the kind of physics we don't model, which would be, which would be collisions in there. So when, when the ball is collide, maybe you form small things that are escaping. That's not something we really, really, really model. So. What is the Stokes number of this movie? Uh, this is a particles between 0.25 and 1. Between? 
meaning that it's it's, it's four different bins. What is this? Yes. Uh, we use four different bins. And, and, and the reason why this is important is that the different stokes number have differential aerodynamic behavior. So if you're stokes number one, you will you will exchange momentum with the gas quicker than stokes number one two five. So so the ones should convert it crashing into the point two five. And that could also add some RMS speed which would be repressing uh, uh, self energetically, but we didn't see that in this case. Uh, there's no uh, transfer between different bins, right? I mean, correlation. Yeah. In case you had uh, only one stokes number in this, yeah. do you think it would take longer or? I think it would take shorter, and especially if I took stokes number one. Sure. Uh, because they are they are really really would they they really like to to clump mm -hmm. together, and then it would take take a shorter time. And also, you know, then there there, there, there would be no differential radial drift. That means there would there would, there would be no RV speed coming from from particles drifting at different speeds. They would all be drifting at the same speed, which means that the if, if, if the true velocity dispersion particle would be low. Would again mean the self gravity would be easy. And what is the Reynolds number of the gas? What is the Reynolds number of the fluid? The Reynolds number. Reynolds number. Oh, the Reynolds number. Oh, this is this is 256 cube. Um, this hyper, right? This the hyper. hyper. So uh, just just an order of magnitude. Oh, I I I mean, what is I don't I don't. It's difficult to estimate. Um, what would it be with the well, we have, the, the best way to estimate it is based on the dissipation value. If you calculated that, if you didn't, I have the alpha value. That would give me the dissipation. No, that's not good enough. I mean, from the you have to integrate the energy spectrum. Yeah. And uh, we have a Mach number of about 0.05 and alpha value of 10 to minus 3. <coughs> I, don't, I don't know if this. I mean, it has to go through the procedure, <coughs> and uh, and uh, that has been done by both Howden and myself and other people as well. Okay. So what, what kind of Reynolds number mm -hmm. did you find? Um, up to a 700. Mm -hmm. so <coughs> yeah. But it's, it's pretty low, uh, it's pretty high resolution, 256 cube added with hyper viscosity, so it's not very, it's not very dissipated. In the, um, in the first, one of the first movies, one saw uh, saw the concentration in the x direction, and I'm surprised that there is uh, not very much concentration at all in the z direction. Yeah. Okay. One so second. What yeah. makes it actually uh, not concentrate in the z direction at all? Then I would claim I would claim the Taylor Proffitt theory will tell you that you don't yeah. have any density variation in the z direction. Yeah. You can have it in the, in the x direction because there the density variation goes into balance with the cold force. Um, but it goes to the of course, gradually. Oh, oh, but we didn't include vertical gravity for, for that movie. Well, I see, that's expanded. Yes, that's right. expanded. But, but we still don't see very much clumping in, in the set direction. It's often mm -hmm. very, very isotropic. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if, if you look at the density structures, they also like big columns in the set direction. Mm -hmm. And this, 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 I think, is due to the same problem too, when you cannot really have any big variation in the set direction. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Further questions? One uh, question is now, well, of course, which is in the spirit of this meeting also. We are not always only talking about what has been done, also what uh, will be done in the future, of course. Um, <coughs> can you say a few words um, that are not yet part of the uh, any of the discussion sessions, but anything that comes to mind yet now, what you want to do in the near future with the, with the science that is related to this, or the talk, perhaps, directly? Yeah, I mean... I mean, one thing I've been looking at is like solving the the the, the, the correlation equations, so so coupling the. Mm -hmm. is, this is fairly complicated. So uh, there 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 there's two issues. One can either try to solve the correlation equation. The correlation equation tells you, let's uh, say, the scientific equation telling you uh, how how a size distribution of particle changes when when the particle collides. And 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 so what I looked at so far and what I'm looking at now is, is a simplified way to do this, where you say, well, the particles have all have different radii, each of the particles, but they cannot interact with each other. They can only grow in radius by by sweeping up some some small dust fluid. Yeah. So it's kind of an, an, a two component pro to the, uh, pro equation. But we have a project at the MPIA where a case case building on this one is previously worked with the correlation equation, I thought about Monte Carlo ways to actually solve the correlation equation with particles. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really, really tricky because with super particles you cannot create new bins, uh, you don't want to create new particles. 
But he, he thinks he's made it out with some kind of um, Monte Carlo approach where you simply say there's a certain probability <coughs> that you need that two particles colliding completely and making something with, with a higher mass. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and this is something I think would be extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. um, And in terms, I mean, yeah, now moving to Leiden, um, in terms of, um, and there you will be working on black hole accretion. Yeah, star so formation. So, um, what do you think that will mean technically for the code? I don't know. If you want to actually work with the code, maybe. I've been sitting uh, with boundary conditions for the vertical boundary conditions for two months now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the first thing that needs to start with. Yeah, technically, mm -hmm. what needs to be improved? It's a good question. I mean, I think with the so gravity and the particle, it, I mean, the pentacle has a lot these days. It has really different, but it has so gravity, it has particles. Um, it's not really clear to me what needs to be improved. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, maybe that's a little bit boring. Well. And we were talking yesterday, somebody mentioned relativity, but that's not one of any of your. No, I don't want to go so mm -hmm. slow. I want to stay away from the relativity. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't have any big coding problems or code improvement on the table. Uh, so, anyone has any idea? <laughs> I, I think isolated boundary conditions is important. Which boundary conditions? Isolated. What are isolated? It means no mass outside. Oh, yeah. Insulating me. Isolated. I, without any mass outside. Uh -huh. So then you need to extrapolate uh, in a certain way. Um, so standard ways to enlarge your your FFT solver to yeah. close a uh, zero me mm -hmm. memory, mm -hmm. zero zero mass outside, but yeah. that's so memory expensive. Yeah. What I know from the flash code is actually he, they use the uh, image mass yeah. copy from uh, between the boundary and cancel out along the boundary. Okay. But Wolfgang, didn't we talk about that once? What's that? Uh, what, uh, did, 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 didn't we talk about this kind of boundary conditions once, where, where we want to assume that there is no <coughs> charge or no mass outside of the box? Mm -hmm. Yes, but, but, I mean, but I mean not, not in, the, in the context of uh, using Fourier for the z-direction, no. which just doesn't make that much sense to me anyway. If, if once you have gravity, that's, I don't think that's, that's the point. Mm -hmm. So one thing one, 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 one could do is to use Fourier in, in X and Y, and, and then, uh, then have a tri-diagonal matrix in set direction. Then you're a little bit more flexible with the boundary conditions, but you still need to think about them completely simply. Um, but but I, I thought you implemented that. And yeah, but I, I never tested it actually. Okay, okay. It's implemented in some way, but I, I, mm. I, I wouldn't trust it as, as it is now. Okay, that's interesting. I mentioned this as a, as a discussion topic perhaps for the future. Maybe this can be um, discussed further. You can explain what you mean by this, and maybe one can, we can think about uh, ways how this has to be done now. Um, okay, I think we should, uh, during this meeting, uh, continue assembling further discussion topics. I've, um, here, clean up a little bit my, the list that I have that I will show a little bit later on, on the screen. But um, for the time being, let's maybe then thank uh, Anders and we will continue leading a few other discuss discussion sessions mm -hmm. uh, later during the week then. So, thank you. <laughs> so, we have uh, Christina Green. Uh, she is from Stanford, working with uh, Sasha Kolzovicev on the problem of. Um, traveling waves in convection.